As previously stated, my name's Kyle. I'm the product support specialist here at Telgard. Um, we're also now under the umbrella of Amatech, which is uh, the company that, that bought us, our parent company. Um, just to give you a little background, I started out in the field, uh, or not in the field, I started in a central station. Uh, then I became a tech in the field where I serviced and installed security systems as well as fire. And then now I'm here at Togard as the product support specialist. I've got roughly 10 years in the industry. So getting into it, we're going over ULC Fire. Um, this is Fire for Canada. I'm pretty sure we all are aware of that at this point. Um, what we're going to cover today is um, Tailguard.com and how you use the site, register your units, um, how to search and view a subscriber, editing communication paths, link supervision and self-test, the maintenance window that will be required uh, to make any changes on an account, the different troubles we can monitor and what they mean, and then we're going to cover uh, prices and uh, any ongoing sales. Uh, as far as the ULC certifications, I thought I removed that. My apologies. We'll have to follow up. Um, I don't currently have the documentation. So getting into how to register a unit. Obviously, this is after you sign up with us and get set up as a dealer. You're going to have your username, your password, um, which all of that either Priscilla or customer service can assist with as, as far as getting you initially set up. But as far as uh, once you are set up, getting into regist uh, registering a Telguard unit, just to go over the process, so you can see that it is relatively simple. We get into our portal. Once you're in, this is the view you'll have. You'll select to register a subscriber. And then you're going to enter the serial number or the ICC ID for that subscribe uh, for the TG7 FS unit that you're going to be installing at the location. Uh, then you're going to validate it. And that's just our process of making sure it's a valid serial number. And then you go through the process of adding all the customer information. So this is going to be information specific to each individual customer. We do have some dealers that will use their address uh, just so they can have a generic address for all installations. After you've entered that information, you're going to select a template. Now, originally you're going to have a very basic template set up on your profile. Uh, this is something I'm going to cover in more detail as far as how to set them up uh, later in the, the presentation. Uh, but you would select a template. This is essentially a pre-configuration uh, that you're selecting, but you can go through and you can edit it as you go. So you can adjust the self-test frequency. You can select which STC relay or if you want to use both, what troubles are tripped on each relay. Um, and then you can edit other various information. Then you will select the communication path. Um, so we have two options, alarm panel CC, which will go over all this stuff uh, in greater detail throughout the presentation. And then there's the TCC, which is Telguard Communication Center. Uh, what's great, alarm panel is going to take the account number and receiver phone numbers in the panel and forward the signals to that location. If you select TCC or Telguard Communication Center, uh, that gives us the ability to, or you the ability to override the account number and the receiver numbers within the panel. Uh, so if it is a takeover and maybe you're locked out, uh, this will help you override the communication path. Uh, it also gives you the ability to select IP, uh, which we're always going to override for IP, um, just so you're aware. But that's essentially uh, 
all there is to that step. And then getting into the next step, this is additional features. So in your case, uh, link supervision for a TG7FS would be enabled. Um, you'll see here I selected standard line security. For you, there would be a 180 second link supervision. Uh, this is required by ULC and it requires that you do have IP receivers. Now, after you've selected that, you'll select a billing plan. Um, you'll see here in my list, I have quite a few options. Yours is going to be, uh, if you're using just TG7s, pretty straightforward, but it's going to be TG7s or you're going to, you're going to see the rate plan is going to be TG7FS uh, with link supervision. And then once you've completed that, uh, you're going to get to an, an overview screen. You're just going to verify that all the information is set up correctly, and then you're going to register. Uh, once you've done that, it's going to give you the subscriber number. Uh, within a prompt, you're going to select OK, and then it's going to put you on a list to all your subscribers. Now, if this is your first install, you're only going to see one. Um, but once you get to this list, uh, you can search the subscriber number if you copy and paste it from that prompt or typically the very top uh, customer listed within this view will be the customer that you just registered. Now, as far as templates go, so templates, uh, it is required that you have at least one template on your account to register a subscriber. Now, if you don't set it up prior to your initial registration, you will be automatically prompt, prompted within the registration process uh, to create a template. Uh, so the way you would create a template if you wanted to do it beforehand, you would go to the dealer tab and go to your dealer profile. Once you're under your dealer profile, you would go to device templates. Now, this is the exact same view that you as the dealer will see um, on the telguard.com portal. Um, as you can see, it lists all my current templates, but if I wanna create a new in the top right corner, you select create template. Within this process, you're going to select which type. Uh, well, first, you're going to name it. So, for example, uh, in this case, I did a TG7 with a monthly test. So I selected the TG4 slash 7 series. And then I selected next. So it knows that this template's only going to apply to TG4 and TG7 series units. Now within this, I can select my format. I can select my device mode of operation, which can be cell only, cell backup, or cell primary. I can select my STC configuration. And then I can select uh, the number of attempts that we try to communicate to central station before a communication failure, um, delays for no service conditions, as well as other things that we'll, we'll get into on the uh, subscriber profile later in the presentation. Um, and then I can select if I want to do alarm panel CC or Telguard Communication Center. The advantage with doing Telguard Communication Center is if you set up your templates with the proper receiver numbers, the only information you're going to have to go back and edit on a, uh, an account basis or per account is going to be the account number. Um, but you can have it to where you set up your templates to where your receiver numbers are automatically applied to all subscriber accounts. Uh, then you're going to get into the section where it asks you, do you want to do two-way voice? Do you want to do link supervision, interactive services? 
uh, or the trip input. Um, in all reality, link supervision is going to be the main purpose here. Uh, as you saw on the list, I had the ability to select ULC 180 second supervision. And then if I check the boxes below, it's going to give me the default restoral and fail codes based off the format. You can customize those as long as you put in the correct length code. Uh, once I've done that, I we verify uh, that our template set up the way we would like, and then we create the template. And then you'll get a prompt indicating that the template was successfully created. And then it'll show up in your list of templates. Now, as far as searching a subscriber, so this is after you've done the registration process or you have a few accounts under your dealer with Telguard. Um, obviously, I started from the beginning, but you would log in with your username and password into Telguard.com. Once you are logged in, uh, you're going to see where you can scroll down and you can search your subscriber. Now you can search the subscriber with the account number, the serial number for the Telguard, the Telguard subscriber number, or the customer name. Once you've got the subscriber pulled up, you'll click on the name, uh, which will be underlined, and it'll prompt you over to the subscriber profile. From the subscriber profile, this is where you can make edits, changes, um, as well as get status reports and view current um, and previous troubles that might have occurred with the unit. You can also go in and uh, confirm your communication path or edit your communication path if need be. Now, as far as editing the communication path, uh, if you look at the subscriber here, uh, you'll see once you search the subscriber and you're in the subscriber profile, uh, the subscriber details is the default tab that you will end up on. Uh, if you're needing to ever edit the communication path, uh, it would be done under device communication. This is where you can select if you want to get the info information from the alarm panel or if you want to override it with our TCC. Uh, this is where you can select the account number that we forward the signal over to as well as uh, select your IP receivers. Now, link supervision. Um, so with link supervision, um, our TCC or Telguard Communication Center monitors check-in signals as heartbeats for the TG7FS. So our units periodically check in to meet five minute, 60 minute requirements as well as 180 seconds for Canada. So for you guys, only the 180 seconds will apply, um, and this is for Canada. Now, check-ins are transparent and non-interfering, meaning while the unit is checking in, if the alarm is tripped or the fire alarm uh, is tripped, the signal still gets delivered to Central Station with no interference. Uh, it's important to note that standard transmission uses SMS where link supervision uses the data portion of the network. So what this means is, is that we're using both sides of the network. Uh, SMS, think of sending a text message, hey, how are you? Versus data, think of sending either a picture, a video, or just getting on Facebook on your smart device, uh, your phone, tablet, so be it. Um, so that's how we avoid the interference by using the data portion of the network for the link supervision and then using SMS to deliver signals to Central Station. 
Now, it's also important to note, which I apologize because I forgot the point. Um, IP is required for ULC 180 second supervision. So with that being said, if you don't already have IP set up with us, that is something that uh, we can gladly get you set up with if you let us know. Um, if you need any assistance or you can call our technical support, they can get you over to one of our two guys that does IP request and they can handle uh, handle getting that put into the database for you. Now, as far as just elaborating how it works, our example here is 60 minute supervision. I understand you all will be using 180 seconds. So understand that instead of a 15 minute check in window, it would be a 60 second check in window for the 180 second supervision. So the way it works is a data packet would be sent from the Telguard unit to our TCC over the network. If we get the check in, all is well. We don't expect another check in. In this case, an example for 60 minute supervision, it would be 15 minutes later. For ULC, which unfortunately I don't have the schematic for, um, every 60 seconds, you're, we're expecting a check in on our back end. So the way it would work is um, as displayed for the 60 minute, we would go based off the last check-in. After 15 minutes, we don't receive our check-in or in your case, uh, it would be 60 seconds. We don't receive a check-in. So then we continue to wait for that check-in. The timer starts based off of the last successful data packet. So after 60 minutes of not receiving an additional data packet for 60 minute supervision, we would trip the supervision and indicate to central station that we have a failure in the supervision. Um, so in the case of ULC with 180 seconds, um, our last check-in, we would then go 60 seconds. We would expect another one if we don't get it. Then we have two more attempts at those 60 second check-ins before we reach the 180 second or three minute mark. And at the three minute mark, we would then send the failure signal. Then once we get the next data packet, at that point we would restore the signal and we would have 180 seconds that we would have to fail three consecutive data check-ins before we would send another failure signal to central station. Now, uh, self-test. So a self-test can validate connectivity to the network in real time. This is a good troubleshooting method. You're also probably gonna be required to have a daily self-test. Um, it validates a connection between the Telguard and RTCC. It does not validate anything with the panel connectivity. So if the Telguard's powered up, and we're able to communicate with it, it will pass a self-test. But that does not validate that the panel is connected to the tow guard or that the communication between the panel and the tow guard is good to go. So just keep that in mind when using it as a method of troubleshooting. Now we can set default test codes, which we just have a check mark box. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, we also allow custom event codes. As long as they're the proper length um, and characters, we don't have an issue with, with you using codes uh, that are custom so that you know exactly what they mean when they hit your central station. The interval that we can test uh, can be six hours, daily, monthly, or weekly. Um, in this case, for ULC, you're either going to be doing six hour or daily. I don't believe six hours necessary for ULC listing for 
from my uh, comprehension and understanding. So I think daily would be the most common use of these four options. Uh, and it's also important that I note that you can also customize the time of the test. So you can select if you want it during the day, during the night. You can pick the date in which it starts. You can pick the time. Uh, so we get very specific so that you can narrow it down within a couple of minutes of when you expect that self-test to occur. Now, one of the big things uh, for us, at least on our end at Togard, when adding uh, Fire for Canada was the requirement of a maintenance window on Togard.com. So a maintenance window is will be required for edits to an active subscribers account, except for the following. So these are the search the situations, excuse me, and circumstances in which a maintenance window is not required. Everything else editing wise, uh, it will be required. So you can edit the customer's name, the industry, which I'll show you in a screenshot here in a bit. That's just indicating if it's residential or if it's commercial. The address of the location. The client account number. And then the device communications, uh, whether you're doing TCC or alarm panel CC, the receiver numbers, the central station account number, and the IP receivers. So all this information can be edited uh, without sending a tech to the site. So maybe a building transfers ownership from one company to another. Uh, at that point, you can go and change the name you can change the account number and you can change any of the communications that you need to. Now, maybe a tech is replacing one unit at one location and moving the previous unit to a new address for the same customer. At that point, you can also edit the address if necessary. Now, how the maintenance window works. So when the unit activates, uh, the Telguard, the TG7FS, so the activation for the TG7FS is done a couple of different ways. Uh, essentially, you can send a signal from your panel through the Telguard, and it will hit our TCC and activate the unit. We now have a couple of other options. Um, our trip input, which is a two pin feature on the board. Uh, you can now use that to activate a unit if you don't have a dialer on site. Uh, if you get into that situation where maybe there's not a dialer or the dialer's going out on the panel, uh, you can contact our tech support and they can gladly walk you through activating the unit without a dialer. Now, once the unit activates, uh, we automatically go into a 10 minute maintenance mode. So once we receive the activation command on our back end, a 10 minute window will start. You can edit anything and everything on the subscriber account during the 10 minute window. Once that 10 minute window expires, uh, any changes that were not saved will revert back to their previous um, saved state. And uh, you'll have to start the window over again. After the unit has been active for some time. So what I mean by active for some time is that the maintenance window after the unit's activation expired any time after that. Uh, to enter the maintenance mode, you essentially need a status report from our unit. Um, so it has to be done by a tech on site. 
And the way it works is once we our back end receives the status report, we go into the maintenance window. So moving on to how to enter maintenance mode. So the one thing you'll find common with three of these four points is that a tech has to be on site. I'm pretty sure you guys are already familiar with that, uh, but a tech has to be on site. Uh, the preferred option and the way that you should be getting the unit into maintenance mode is press and hold the RSSI button, which is the uh, signal strength button on our unit for five to 10 seconds. And it generates a status report that then puts the subscriber in a maintenance mode. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, as long as the unit's able to communicate, if you press and hold that button for five to 10 seconds, which it actually flashes all eight LEDs once per second. So you can actually count the number of flashes until you get to five, then you can release and you should see it then send in a status report to us. Uh, the next option is if that doesn't work, the tech can press the reset button on the tail guard board in the top center. Um, this is not the preferred method, but this is a method that will work for your tech on site. Um, you don't have to pay attention to how long you're holding a button. You literally just press and release, and it should generate a status report to our back end that should then put the unit into a maintenance mode. Uh, and then final resort would be the tech can power cycle the unit. Obviously, um, this is always an option if you're ever having issues with the tail guard unit to power cycle it, but we would prefer that you try to stick with the RSSI button and uh, pressing and holding it for five seconds. Now, for some reason, none of these three options work for your tech on the site. Um, at that point, calling our technical support would be probably your best option. Uh, they're trained up pretty well on ULC as well as how the maintenance mode works and how to get it into maintenance mode, what you can edit during maintenance mode, and how to save everything prior to that window expiring. Now, um, how to know when you're in maintenance mode. So this screenshot I feel is pretty self-explanatory. And if you look here, uh, you'll see circled in red, maintenance window expires in five minutes and 41 seconds. Alarm functions remain active. So it's important to note that a maintenance mode with tail guard is not the same as putting your account in test with your central station. While in maintenance mode, if the alarm panel triggers and sends a failure to communicate or a zone one pull station or a low battery, those signals will be transmitted to the destination that you specified within our device communication section. So your central station will receive the signal and they will react accordingly if you haven't put it on test with your central station. So it's very important to know that everything remains active on our end, even though we're allowing you to edit the subscriber information. Now, no matter which tab I'm on, whether it be the subscriber details tab, the device details tab, notification history or expansion modules, um, so on and so forth, you will see that same banner at the top that indicates the, when the, how long before the maintenance window expires, and it even specifies minutes and seconds just so there's no confusion. And then again, it tells you just so you don't forget everything remains active so that you won't hopefully make the mistake of getting uh, the, police, uh, the fire department dispatched out to the location. Uh, the timer starts at 10 minutes. It expires after 10 minutes. If you need more time, you will have to enter a new 10 minute maintenance window. 
There is no way to shorten the window. The only way to extend the time that you have to edit is by creating a new window. So just keep that in mind. Um, when you call tech support or when you're looking at the account, uh, just because it's in maintenance mode, as I've already stated, it's still active. But no, there's no way to prematurely end that time window. Now, getting into the tail guard troubles and um, defining them. Now, I'm just going to give a brief run through um, over the acronyms and the brief meanings, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with each. Uh, the reason we go over these is because during the registration process, it would be helpful if you understood what these troubles were so that you could set your STC or system trouble condition relays up properly so that you can monitor the tail guard troubles. Now understand these are the tail guard troubles. These are not troubles that are going to relate to your panel. They're not going to relate necessarily to your phone lines if you have any or uh, anything other than the tail guard specifically. So ACFC or AC failure condition, this just means we're not getting an acceptable level of voltage from the AC transformer. Uh, LBC stands for low battery condition. It means we're not getting enough voltage from the battery to read it as a good battery. Uh, LFC line fault condition. Uh, this is only in a backup state. So in most cases, this will not apply, but in some cases it will. So line fault condition, this means that the tail guard is a backup means of communication with a phone line connected in the, in the bottom gray port on the tail guard itself. Um, and what we're doing is we're monitoring voltage. Uh, NSC or no service condition, this is where we can't connect to the cellular network. RFC or radio failure condition. condition. Uh, for ULC, we had to add a new requirement for a radio failure condition for end-to-end -end acknowledgement. I'll get into all that in more detail, but this is essentially where we can't transmit uh, the signal even though we're able to connect to the network. CFC or control failure to communicate. Um, this is only going to occur if the tail guard is set up as a backup. We monitor the number of attempts that the phone line tries to deliver signals to central station before we consider uh, a communication failure. And then we will transfer over to communicating that signal over the cellular rather than the landline. And then PPF stands for panel panel presence failure. Uh, this is where the tail guard doesn't connect, uh, does not detect a connection to the panel. So getting a little further into it, AC failure condition. Um, we work with the provided transformer rated at 12 volts, 0.8 amps. So you should be working with 12 volts, 0.8 amps. Um, if you get an AC failure condition, uh, at your judgment, you can have the customer look if you would like, but if you call our tech support, we're going to require a technician on site to assist you. Now the low battery condition, um, 11 volts is the acceptable level. So if it's below 11 volts, we're going to read a low battery. It's very important to note that this is referring to the TG7FS battery. This is not referring to your panel's backup battery. This is not referring to any of your wireless devices or smoke detectors. This is referring specifically to the TG7FS. Uh, and unfortunately, Unless you're seeing a bunch of AC failure conditions where maybe they're losing power at the location due to a hurricane, a tornado, or some other act of God, 
um, or maybe they're just having construction done at the site. If you're not seeing AC failure conditions and you're getting a low battery condition, that means you're gonna have to send a tech out to the site to replace the battery. Now, if you are seeing AC failure conditions, obviously that battery is low because it is powering the unit rather than sitting in standby mode. So keep that in mind. And if you're able to correct the AC failure condition, the battery in most cases will restore uh, and recharge itself. Now a line fault condition. Uh, this is where we're monitoring the voltage of a telco line or a POTS line. Uh, the minimum acceptable voltage is 28 volts. Um, so we did this to account for VoIP or voice over IP lines uh, that produce significantly less voltage than our standard plain old telephone service or POTS. Um, our POTS is typically at 48, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, this trouble condition only exists if you're connecting the POTS line to the TG7FS in the bottom gray port. So if the panel has a incoming connection from a phone line and an incoming connection from the tail guard, the tail guard will never create a line fault condition if that voltage on that POTS line drops. So keep that in mind and understand that this will only apply when the phone line is connecting to the tail guard itself. Um, it's going to require a tech on site in most cases. Now I know this comes up a lot. I used to be a tech out in the field. Uh, and it most commonly comes up when the telephone service provider at a business has changed and or the wiring configuration is no longer the same. Um, as we know, they like to swap the tip and ring wiring around and it throws us for a loop. Um, that's just a helpful hint to troubleshoot any trouble, uh, any issues that come up with line fault. And then a no service condition or NSC. So NSC, no service condition. This means we're not able to connect to the cellular network. So this could be from a few things. Um, is it the hardware? Is the network down? Is it something locally interfering? Um, more often than not, it depends on your signal strength. If you're sitting at a bar and a half of signal strength, we're going to tell you to improve your signal strength. If you're sitting, sitting at three bars of signal strength and you're occasionally dropping off, uh, at that point it could be a network issue. It could be uh, the metal building that the TG7FS is potentially installed in, uh, or it could be something like a cell booster. Um, those come up seldomly. I'm not going to go any further into the cell booster portion of that, but think of interference and anything that puts off an RF signal being in the immediate vicinity of the tail guard uh, could potentially throw the tail guard into a trouble. Now, as far as troubleshooting a no service condition, because it, it is one of the more common troubles that comes up. Um, Try to get a status report from the unit through telguard.com or call our technical support. Um, our signal strength requirement for LTE units doing any type of link supervision for fire is two and a half bars or better. So if you have 2.5 bars of signal strength or better, uh, your unit should be working. And if it's not at that point, you need to contact us and have us look into what's going on because improving the signal strength might not be a, a resolution for you. Now, something to keep in mind is that any troubles we can create, we also have the ability to set uh, peripherals for. So we can set delays. So for the no service condition, uh, for example, say this is coming up at a location, maybe it comes up once a week. After talking to tech support, 
the units falling off the network for 25 seconds, your delay is set to zero. At that point, we would recommend putting a 30 second delay and then the trouble probably completely disappears and the customer knows none the wiser. Um, obviously, we're not saying uh, be deceptive towards your customers, but we also know that there are those those phantom signals that happen from time to time or those minimal circumstances where uh, the units technically it should be fine because it's maybe falling off for 25 seconds once a week. So we extend that delay so the customer doesn't worry. Uh, now, another note, if you can't connect to the unit, then it's probably going to require a tech on site. You can contact our tech support and we can look at any other options for you. But typically with a no service condition, if you can't connect, we can't connect. And if no one can connect, at that point, it would typically require a technician on site. Now, radio failure condition. So, hang on, let me see. There we go. So, uh, an RFC or radio failure condition is when the unit has adequate signal strength, but is not able to communicate. Excuse me. Um, so you're probably wondering, well, how can it not communicate if it has adequate signal strength? Well, this could be an issue with formats not being com compatible with one another. This could be uh, where the panel takes the tail guard off hook too regularly to check for line voltage. That has come up with some Siemens panels in the past. Uh, we have already dealt with that, but just know that is something that could come up again one day in the future, depending on how panel configurations change. Now, uh, the most common cause for an RFC with a TG7FS is typically an issue with the link supervision. So if the link supervision fails, it will create an RFC and we will trip your STC relay to indicate an RFC trouble to your central station. What will also happen is we will send in the failure code for the link supervision. So it's essentially, it's a fail safe or it's a duplicate method uh, or redundancy so that you have those in place in case something goes down with the communication. Now for ULC specifically, we had to add end-to-end -end acknowledgement. What this means is, is not only is this communication from the panel to the tail guard and then the tail guard to RTCC, but then also includes from RTCC to your central station. Uh, previously, this was not a requirement. Uh, now it is required that we receive an acknowledgement within 60 seconds from the central station from the central station receiver when we deliver a signal or an RFC will be created on the unit. Um, so this is a way of validating or knowing that you are actually getting your signals all the way through to central station. Now I control failure to communicate uh, I'm going to be brief here because this is for cell backup. Uh, this is where we monitor the number of communication attempts the alarm panel makes over a telco that is connected to the bottom gray port of the tail guard. Once we reach the set number of events, which you as the dealer can set anywhere from one all the way up to, I believe, nine. So if you set it to one after one failed attempt over the POTS line, it will convert to cellular. It'll send the signal out and get it to central station. Um, again, this is when the TG7FS is a backup. 
and then, like I said, you can adjust the number of attempts. Uh, I believe it's one to nine. And then the panel presence failure. Uh, this feature also I'm going to be quick on. Uh, this is not one that's commonly used. But we refer to it as PPF, which stands for panel presence failure. Um, this is when the tail guard does not connect a connection to the panel. So this connection is monitored through the tip and ring, tip return, and ring return connections on the RJ cable. So what happens, our tail guard puts out 30 or, as of recently, 40 volts to the tip and ring on the panel. Well, I'm sure you're aware that the returns create a circuit that returns the voltage back to its originator, or in this case, the tail guard. So if we put out 30 volts, we expect to see 30 volts in return, whereas if we put out 40 volts, we expect to see 40 volts in return. So when the voltage is lost, meaning on the return section coming back to the tail guard, when the tail guard no longer sees that voltage, uh, it creates the PPF. So the ways this can happen, maybe a guy doesn't screw down the terminals all the way, um, or the actual thought process behind it is if somebody did break in to the location, uh, if they cut the RJ cord between the tail guard and the, and the panel, uh, at that point it would create a PPF and it would be reported to Central Station. Now, just to uh, define our terminology real quick, just so everyone understands when they call our tech support what we're saying um, and to prevent any miscommunications, obviously, if you're not understanding, we're going to approach it from a different angle and, and see if we can we can help you out. But um, TCC it stands for Tail Guard Communication Center. So pretty straightforward there. Uh, telco or POTS is what we use to refer to a phone line or plain old telephone service. Uh, so if you hear us use the phrase telco or POTS. We're talking about not the tail guard, but hard copper wire lines, or at this point now VoIP lines uh, at the location. And then mode of operation. So this is the way the tail guard will work. There are three possible settings. There's cell primary. Uh, this means that the tail guard will transmit the signals at all times unless we lose cellular signal or service, uh, at which time it defers to the telco connection. So cellular primary means that the, the tail guard unit is the primary path of communication, but it also means we are expecting for a POTS line to be connected into the bottom gray port of that tail guard unit. If we don't see that connection with the POTS line on the bottom gray port, we will go into a line fault condition. Uh, cellular backup. This is exactly as it sounds. Uh, this is where the tail guard will allow the panel to communicate over the phone line um, with the tail guard as a backup. So obviously, again, this means the tail guard's deciding if it's the phone line or the tail guard that dials first. So this means the phone line should be connected to the bottom gray port on the TG7FS. And the last and final is cellular only. This means cell is the only path being used. It's sole path, which means also link supervision is enabled. Uh, at that point, you're not expecting any troubles as far as an LFC or a CFC, and you're not expecting a POTS or telco line at the location. Now, it is important to know, if the phone line is connecting to the panel, and the panel is deciding whether the tail guard dials out or the phone line dials out, 
the tail guard should be set as cellular only because the tail guard is not deciding which communication path to take. It is only dialing out when it receives the message from the panel. Now, as far as uh, cell primary or cell backup, if you're putting the tail guard in those modes, that means you're telling the tail guard, okay, you're deciding if it's the phone line or if it's the, the cell communicator that's sending the signal across. So the reason I go into detail is because if the panel has the phone line connected to it, it should be cell only versus if the phone line's connecting to the tail guard. So when you think of mode of operation, think of which device is deciding which path I take. If it's the tail guard, primary or backup. If it's the panel, cell only. Uh, and then the last thing is self-test. So this is a test performed by the TCC uh, on the tail guard, on the tail, excuse me, to ensure the tail guard radio has a connection to the cellular network. So this just ensures that we're getting out the signal to the tail guard. The tail guard's able to get it back to us. Kyle, thank you so much for uh, getting out your presentation, and I'd like to thank everybody for stopping in.